Hi, welcome to Offscript. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, we're taking a look at Paul Thomas Anderson's Licorice Pizza, the movie that uh, delighted film Twitter last year. Uh, we finally got to see it. It's on Amazon Prime Video, and we're going to tell you what we thought. We also are taking a look at Belfast, the Kenneth Branagh feature. Branagh? Branagh? is now on HBO Max. Uh, we took a look at it, got nominated for like seven Academy Awards, and we are here to tell you whether or not it's better than Death in the Nile, the other movie that came out the same year from the same director <laughs> that we did not like but didn't get any Oscar nominations. So let's jump into it. Uh, before we get to all that, we need to do the news, of course. And our first story, oh, 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 and, and, and the fall movie preview. We're talking about what's coming out in the next few months in between our two reviews, so stick around for that. Before that, we got to do the news. Our first story this week, Embracer Group acquires the IP rights to Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. This was a smaller story that might have snuck by your timeline if you weren't paying attention because it doesn't really mean anything. We all know Amazon Prime is doing their new Lord of the Rings series. Nobody knows what Embracer Group is. So now, you boys are off script. We're here to break it down for you. Or really, I'm going to be honest, kind of Andy because I'm not exactly sure who Embracer Group is either. Andy, what's this about? So the Embracer Group is a Swedish video game uh, company uh, who, ha who has now... They own not everything Lord of the Rings, but but pretty much uh, they they own the the film and the film and TV rights of both Lord of the Rings trilogy and the Hobbit trilogy. They also own uh, any video, video game licensing, board game merchandise, theme parks, stage production, Whoa. basically everything except the books. Uh, the Saul Zantz company is who owns the uh, I think the the literary rights, and no one's ever going to let go of those. Um, but the the properties themselves um like i said the, a new company owns them and they're looking to explore uh, some some new things um there's were other works of tolkien that haven't been uh published even and so they're going to be looking to either i don't know make more films or get in uh to tv somehow there's a loophole with the uh um Sorry, another story just broken. I'm a little distracted. <laughs> uh, oh, if oh, you ch on. check out the time timeline, but uh, the uh, the Lord of the Rings show that's about to start on Amazon Prime is actually somehow there's a loophole that this isn't part of the, those rights. So it's going to be, I think, Amazon's going to own just that that show or just television rights, uh, possibly. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a big deal. It's the changing hands of the very profitable Lord of the Rings uh, franchise. Uh, like I said, I don't know a lot about Embracer Group, but I do know they're a Swedish company. They're relatively new, and they're buying big properties <laughs> like as much as they can. I know they've got some 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 obvious uh, fingers and pies for video games because they are inherently a video game company. But it seems like they're not straying from film properties like this or literary works, I guess, in the real case of Lord of the Rings. Uh, I don't know what it's all leading to. It seems a whole lot like they're just buying up properties as fast as they can to try to turn into something. Maybe they're looking to get acquired. I'm not sure. I don't, I don't know how you have that kind of capital to buy properties like this, uh, but they're moving it around and it sure is shaken. I don't know what this means for the future of Lord of the Rings, at least on film. I know they express some interest to maybe make more films or make kind of origin stories, things for like Gandalf or Aon, I don't even know, but 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 it is odd. It is odd that Amazon is making this thing now. Lord of the Rings is maybe about to have a bit of a resurgence if that new series is any good. And suddenly, a Swedish video game company has the keys to the kingdom. Right? It's strange. Like, how has somebody bigger not bought this yet? And and I don't, I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you. But that's that's what I think. Uh, Andy, I want to know what you think. But I, I'm what 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 was the story that broke? Is it over here? I'm like, I'm not, what do I see? <laughs> yeah. So um. This is from De Deadline. Also, uh, Aquaman two heads to Christmas twenty twenty three. Shazam: Fury of the Gods goes to March, and HBO Max uh, uh, Pictures House Party and Evil Dead Rise going to theatrical release. Yeah. Okay. This, uh, this is massive. So, so some moves. Yeah. Wait, so we've had some big uh, date changes just now. This just dropped. Um, Aquaman 2 was supposed to come out in March, so it's going to be coming out all the way in Christmas 2023. That's a pretty big move. Um, Shazam! Fear of the Gods was going to come out in uh, December 21st up against Avatar, which is probably kind of a mistake. And that's going to be moving to to March uh, 2023. So just a, just a couple of months. Uh, but, but the other big news is that uh, House Party and Evil Dead Rise, which were both going to be HBO Max films, are now getting theatrical releases. Um, so some big moves over at Warner Brothers. 
I tell you, I'm excited about Evil Dead in theaters. Uh, I went and saw the last Evil Dead remake, I think 2016 Evil Dead, uh, in theaters. It was great. Saw, saw an early screening of it. Big crowd. Tons of fun. I bet Evil Dead Rise has the same energy. Don't know, what, don't, don't know about House Party, but I am surprised by the moves. Uh, I guess it feels safer to put Aquaman 2 against new Star Wars, whatever that's going to be. Um, let me tell you, when I watched the first Aquaman, the first thing I thought was, you know what this series could be used? Five years on ice. <laughs> <laughs> you are you are do to, anything sir, here for half sir. a decade and then come back uh so sir, you were talking about the most profitable dc property to date don't forget Aquaman. that oh i should yeah no which, which, which is which, which is shameful but it is it's somehow. fine uh yeah as far as shazam moving i think that's probably a safe as well yeah this is break dude, breaking news this just happened all right well hey if there's anywhere gonna get breaking news on um, movie news it's gonna be off script so if you like what we're doing here throw us a subscription shameless plug with that we should probably move on to our next story uh movie pass is coming <laughs> back what <laughs> <laughs> How is this possible? Uh, the service that that, that was uh, ultimately uh, thrown to the wolves got really big and then really small really fast that was offering free movies a few summers back to anybody who had a movie pass uh, card is returning after bankruptcy and scandal and shame and outrage. Uh, Andy, how, 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 how is this possible? So movie pass kind of has had this really crazy story of ownership. Uh, they went bankrupt after this, you know, ten ten dollars a month uh, film experiment uh, went belly up after a few, like eight eight or nine months. Um, they ran out of money. Everyone lost a lot of cash. Uh, they got sued. All this stuff. Um, but so they failed, filed for bankruptcy. And the original creator uh, or uh, kind of founder of Movie Pass bought the brand back. Um, and has restarted it again. We don't have any uh, real price points, but there's going to be kind of th- uh, th- three tiers of it, probably like 10, 20, 30 uh, dollars. And you'll, you'll get your, you know, the more you pay, the more movies you'll be able to see a month. But it's going to be much more sustainable than whatever they were attempting to do uh, before. Yeah. Uh, for now, all we know about this new service is it will range between 10 20 and $30 a month. And uh, that's about it. Each subscription option will give the users credits to cash in each month to see movies. There will be no unlimited viewing option, at least during the service's beta version, as was reported by new owner Stacy Spikes. All right, that's who owns it, uh, who was a uh, former co-founder who became its CEO and then wasn't CEO. I guess he's all back in. And he said upon movie passes return, uh, quote, we're going to make mistakes way ahead of you. Uh, we're not going to get it right out of the box. It's going to be trial and error. That's great. Honestly, like I think movie pass is fondly remembered by a lot of people who saw a lot of movies really cheap. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't know if it's got the smoke without unlimited movies. I mean, unless it's like doing, what AMC, A List, and Cinemark Movie Club, and all of these like newfound uh, movie subscription services that pretty much exist solely in response to what MoviePass did, which is bananas, a pioneer in the industry. I don't know if it's going to have the same smoke. You know, like you got to you got free movies. It's got it's got to be basically free movies. That's what it needs to feel like. I don't yeah, know how I, to do it. Yeah. Um, well, now it's also entering a crowded market, and for. All it's, um, I mean, Movie Pass was this massive failed experiment that we all knew wasn't going to work, but it did bring about significant change within the exhibitor industry in that it forced every chain to develop some sort of, uh, you know, rewards, not rewards program, but like a, a monthly subscription service to see movies. Um, you know, they, they didn't have anything like that before Movie Pass, and now there's AMC Stubs, there's uh, Cinemark Club, there's Alamo Draft House. Like everyone's got their own subscription service now, and that didn't happen. That wouldn't have happened without Movie Pass. It's true. Movie, movie Pass blazed a trail uh, for better or worse. I'm interested to see what this turns into. Like I said, don't know what the offerings are really going to be yet. They've been uh discreetly mum about it so we'll find out more when we know more and we'll talk about it here i don't have script our last story this week uh the batman director matt reeves sets a multi-year first look deal at warner brothers and re-ups with warner brothers tv yes amid the hbo max and discovery merger one thing has been made clear discovery has big plans for dc and i think that starts with director matt reeves of the batman the movie was a huge success followed in the footsteps of todd phillips joker 
And who knows where we're going next? But we know we're getting a joke, Joker 2, and now Matt Reeves has the keys to the kingdom. Andy, what do you know about this? Well, uh, with the success, the massive success of Batman, um, Matt Reeves has this, uh, what they call first look deal. So basically anything, his projects, uh, the, the new projects that he makes, um, uh, Warner brothers will have, have the first look to distribute those or, uh, to kind of sell them off. And, uh, this is a good thing for DC. Good thing for superhero movies. Uh, that we were, we were discussing that, you know, DC put all their money on Zack Snyder, and he never once delivered. <laughs> he never once brought them a billion dollar movie. And Matt Reeves did it. Uh, I mean, the, the Batman wasn't wasn't quite a billion dollars, but you know, seven hundred million, massively successful. Um, first first film out of the gate. So uh, he's shown that he can do it. And again, we we have a sequel to the Batman uh, coming. We have the Penguin uh, series that's going to be on HBO Max. And who knows what what else? I think. You know, despite their radical moves, whether that be uh, putting movies day and date on their service along with in theaters in 2021 or making Christopher Nolan mad and a few other big directors with the recent announcements regarding their content library and the merger with the, with Discovery. Uh, Christopher Nolan was a different thing, though. Obviously, that was 10. Anyway, uh, I, I think one thing is clear. Um <laughs> They they really they really want to keep doing the superhero thing, and I think this is a good direction. I think it's better than the Snyder direction. I, I think the only reason Snyder ever really got in here is because of Three Hundred and Watchmen, right? Two comic book properties that did really well, and they thought, well, let's just hand it all over to an auteur, and he'll run the whole thing. And it didn't quite work. Uh, I don't know why that is. I think. They want to start emulating kind of what Marvel's doing. And I think a good way to do that is to lean on the talent you already have and don't be afraid to invite, invite in other people to do something that's uniquely their own. I think DC has a lot of space in the superhero, I don't know, market share right now because their movies feel uniquely more art house and indie than any of Marvel's recent offerings. Marvel is becoming stale and DC <laughs> is becoming... A, a phoenix rising from the ashes i i don't believe it but if they if they navigate this right if they if they thread that needle dc might be i mean meteoric rise to the top is potential here like but also they've got avatar 2 coming <laughs> shazam, or avatar uh, uh, aquaman 2 and shazam and and uh oh god the flash so i don't know what exactly is next <laughs> but this seems like a bold direction yeah, it's interesting uh, with the other st with uh, the the other story we're talking about dates moving um, Aquaman two that's still firmly kind of in the Snyderverse, so it'll be interesting how this all blends together. Although that movie kind of it, it could just kind of it might be separate enough to be its own adventure, and they yeah they, like they Shazam, may, might just work around it. I remember Shazam feeling really uniquely its own in theaters, and I think that can still work here. Aquaman 2 is up for debate. I, I think there's a Wonder Woman 3 coming at some point. I don't know what that looks like. Um, I mean, as far as I know, J didn't Jason Momoa tweet a picture of, of Ben Affleck on set for Aquaman 2? Yeah. Doing Bruce Wayne stuff? So, like, <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe the Flash movie is going to wrap this all up, right? Maybe that'll be the thing uh, well that's the but, thing the flash movie will come out before aquaman now yeah that's that's true actually oh god you're right <laughs> okay so i don't know but what's it, gonna be it, happening in the flash right but it, it, anyways matt reeves is get, gonna be just doing a lot more dc content uh and they're they're kind of showing the direction they're gonna go maybe with these uh letting directors r really do unique things because uh we know joker 2 is going to be a musical Lady Gaga is going to be in it. It's going to be, I mean, there's never been a superhero musical uh, like that before. So it's going to be um, really interesting to see how, what happens going forward. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, keep it here on off script for more. I, I don't know what exactly Matt Reeves is doing next. Like Andy said, I know there's a Batman sequel coming out. There's the Penguin show. But after that, I, I mean, I could be headed anywhere. So keep it on off script for more and with that we should move into our first uh movie of the episode sorry i'm gonna be taking the summary on this one so please excuse any clumsy delivery uh, the movie is 2021's licorice pizza 
So Licorice Pizza is a nostalgic summer love story set in 1973 Hollywood. Uh, when on the school picture day, one of the last days of school, uh, young Cooper Hoffman, uh, 15 years old. It's not actually his character's name. His character's name is Gary. Gary. Yeah. Oh, we've lost him. Uh, the character's name is Gary Valentine, played by Coop. Sorry. Oh, he's back. He's back. I picked it up. I picked it up without. I with... Yes. Uh, Cooper Hoffman plays Gary Valentine, a young 15 year old at school who happens to notice a 25 year old. Uh, oh, my God. Her name is not Alana, Alana Haim. Well, no, Alana Haim is the actor. Oh, Alana. The name of the character is. Oh, yeah, it's just Alana. Alana, not Alana Valentine. I don't remember. Uh, he sees 25 year old Alana while he's standing in line and he takes his shot and he goes and flirts with her. And it actually works. She goes to dinner with him, but they're not boyfriend and girlfriend. They're just friends. And over the course of the summer, the two of them go on these kind of wild misadventures uh, to, to just kind of, I don't know, start a business, discover themselves and uh, maybe find a little bit of summer love uh the movie is from paul thomas anderson director of such classics as there will be blood the master phantom thread uh most recently inherent vice and now uh it is on amazon prime and we watched it and we're here to talk about it andy what did you think of licorice pizza uh this movie felt really weird to me uh, just the premise of a you know a 15 year old boy and a 25 year old woman having really any kind of relationship like this uh it's uncomfortable and it it's kind of written ar around because gary is written as uh, a superhero basically he is 15 he owns several businesses he is a successful child actor um his parents work for him this this almost sounds like you know those 90s movies like richie rich or blank check it's just kind of this fantasy it's like yeah. fantasy wish fulfillment um like I said, Gary's 15, which college freshman or finishing eighth grade, something like that, finishing ninth grade. Uh, he, he speaks to women with the confidence of, you know, a grown 30 year old man, you know, like he, he talks to, you know, Alana Hay or Alana um, just very confidently. And I was like, I don't know any 15 year old that would talk to a full, Never. you know, an adult no. woman like that. Um, so it's kind of weird. I don't know. I guess you could just write that differently. You could have written him graduating high school or, you know, to be just being 18, 19, they would still have a pretty big age gap or you, or you could make her a little bit younger as, as well. But that, that just kind of made me feel weird throughout the whole movie. Um, and just, I, I I'm not sure what, what it's supposed to get. I mean, they do, they go on a series of, of adventures. Like she ends up being his chaperone. So he can go to this, a child this acting thing in new york you know they grow closer they they start a, a couple of harebrained businesses they're in the waterbed business for a while when those first come out they get into the pinball business it's but it's like you know he, he's a child yeah so, so he still isn't um you know he makes a lot of poor decisions and she's uh but you know she does a lot of things to like make him jealous they do things to make each other jealous and it's just it's such a juvenile relationship that it's just the whole thing is is just i found really kind of difficult to believe wasn't believable um and i just couldn't really get on board with it at any point so paul thomas anderson's films i think traditionally are uh, not necessarily non-linear but a lot of them take place over like relatively large amounts of time and they're put together in an order that makes it feel like you're kind of jumping through days and weeks like from scene to scene on occasion and this film is no different uh licorice pizza takes place over a summer and it is a two hour and 13 minute film a little long in my opinion but we'll get to that uh, the scenes and kind of set pieces and the situations that Alana and Gary are going through are a little disjointed uh, because they often are taking place, you know, one, one will be the beginning of the summer, the next will be three weeks in. Uh, like Andy said, they uh, become business partners, they start multiple businesses, Alana has a different job that she takes later in the film with another group of characters, they both experience multiple relationships over the course of this movie. And it's all meant to wrap up into this picket, this package of like nostalgic summer fling, right? Like the 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 uh, rose-colored lens uh, of, of viewing childhood from afar, right? Looking back at like, boy, wasn't that what weren't those the days, right? When Coke was twenty-five cents, and uh, you could you could hit on a twenty-five-year-old, nobody cared. Um, it it's 
I think I, I think it works for me in that way, but ultimately I didn't find myself just like really charmed by it. Anderson's camera work is spot on. I think his lighting is great, really good blocking, really good shot composition. I like the look of this movie a lot, and I like the people in it. Alana Haim's pretty good. I, I, she's you know this is kind of her first real role. I know she's in the band Haim with her sisters. Uh, but she's not done a lot of movie work. She's fine. Uh, Cooper Hoffman is actually uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's son uh, who uh, passed away, unfortunately. Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman had worked with uh, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson on Boogie Nights and Punch Drunk Love and a couple other features. Uh, he, Cooper's great. Cooper Hoffman's really good. I actually like him a lot. I I, I wish he'd, he'd been adver- advertised as a bit more charismatic because I feel like in the advertising for the film, he just kind of looked like a schlub. And he's supposed to be a bit more of like a, a charismatic Ferris Bueller kind of actor kid. You got a supporting cast that's surprisingly good, but is barely in the film. Uh, Sean Penn, Tom Waits, uh, Bradley Cooper. Who else is in this movie? Uh, Benny Safdie is in here. Uh, they, they, they find supporting characters, but ultimately everything is meant to wrap up into this package of like, I don't know, like nostalgic fling. And unfortunately, like, you know, I, I did not grow up in this world and it just seems so like dreamlike far-fetched it, it the, the situations gary gets into are, are so silly and it, they just it, they come from a place that that is uh uniquely original and i'll talk about that in a second yeah it, it just um their their ages are just too too wide you know they're 10 years apart <laughs> yeah. and it's i mean the, but the, they act kind of the same age so like He's a little mature for his age, and she's immature for her age. So th- they should have r- written them both to be like between eighteen and twenty-two, something like that. Um, and I know that it's really just the opening scene where he's like in in school taking this picture, but like the rest is of him like literally owning businesses, like rubbing elbows with established business owners at, at this restaurant that that he goes to a lot. Um, yeah, it's just it, it's so fan. It's so. <laughs> fantastical and wishful film and I, I just couldn't get into the story yeah and i've heard people say that this is you know hey this is bold cinema right this is this is this is weird and it's different and it kind of is but like at the same time it feels more like a richard linklater picture like it reminded me of like days and confused or like everybody wants some like just kind yeah. of a hangout movie set in the 70s right featuring kids running around in bell bottoms and like pastel colored shirts it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I, I, man, I've seen Paul Thomas Anderson touch greatness, right? Like <laughs> that guy's put out some real bangers and this one just doesn't quite pass it for me. Uh, I, I think you're right. Like ultimately all of these situations are grounded in this reality that like a 25 year old is seeing a 15 year old and it's just, it just feels weird. It doesn't feel like it would work if the if the genders were reversed if it was a 25 year old dude and a 15 year old girl in high school this movie would have gotten a lot more attention for a lot worse reason um and and they do a fine job of towing around it they kind of get it, get it out of the way really quickly that like hey there's a big age gap here and the character's like well, we're not boyfriend and girlfriend we're, we're we're just we're just friends but like the whole thing is built around their relationship so like they could say that but if that's not how the characters are actually acting on screen, that's not necessarily how we feel. Uh, there is, I don't, I don't know, a, a a lack of like a thematic structure, I think, to bring it all together, together and really make it work. Because, yeah, you have, you'll have weeks between events. Uh, your characters will start a job and then they will leave that job. <laughs> they will yeah. start a business and be horrendously successful which which is an issue of character like gary is like andy said like very charismatic and he does not act like a 15 year old uh he acts like a 30 year old and alana meanwhile acts like a 15 year old and i think the idea is that they're supposed to kind of have this exchange of ideals but uh, the film is based on here's where it comes from here's where licorice pizza comes from i'll tell you right now licorice pizza comes from the musings of hollywood producer gary goatsman goatsman uh who is gary valentine in the movie uh all of the stories come from stories that gary goatsman has told paul thomas Anderson over the year over the years about how when he was a kid and he was like oh yeah i used to be on yours mine and ours with with uh with lucille ball and that's that's in this movie and i i used to i i had a waterbed business and i was I, you know hanging out with a 25 year old girl like it just sounds like junk <laughs> 
Yeah, man, that, that, just, that just like none okay, of that sounds so, real. So like some senile guy <laughs> told yeah. you a bunch of stuff that never happened, and you're like, yeah, this, 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 yeah, this would make a great movie. Yeah, and and like one of the most interesting directors of the 21st century decided to adapt it in adapt that drivel into a film. And the performances in it are good. I, I like the way it's made but like ultimately it's, it's just a little too freewheel for me I, I wanted something with some pulp and i just didn't get it out of licorice pizza yeah i i, I didn't either and uh i mean i think it does it is trying to say something about you know young love and you know the the first person you really fall for uh you know this i, I think alana's character is a little bit more interesting for me because she kind of she, she starts she tries to latch on to other successful men like th there's another kind of young actor played by a scholar gazondo uh who she dates early in the film that that she meets through gary and then you know she she auditions for something where sean penn is there and they they go out on on a date she uses that to kind of make him jealous and uh so she's kind of trying to hit, hit your wagon to a star for a lot of the films but but i think is realizing that that's kind of empty so that's kind of the only kind of deeper thing that i i see but it's just her i, I don't really know what's going on going on with gary <laughs> he's yeah, the same I person from beginning to end and you're tapping into like some other pretty harsh critiques i heard of this film um you know people i, I remember when it came out people said they had problems with relationships additionally people had problems with the general like male women power shift in this film like every dude is in a position of power and every woman is is under that all the time and constantly like chasing and gasping for air uh maybe that's just a reflection of the 70s which is just an observation uh, additionally there's a character in here who does a really pretty pretty atrocious asian accent gag uh a few times that is not super tasteful like i get it's a joke but like man <laughs> it's it's yeah, just that, painful to watch. i remember like, hearing it I remember hearing about that too. And um, yeah. It, and so what it does is, is there's a, a white man who has a Japanese wife who at some point he gets a different Japanese wife, but when he talks to them, he does it in like a really like thick like, ac really, Asian accent really leans in. And, and I, like, I've, yeah. Yeah. I didn't really know why that, why that was, it didn't make any sense. I, the, I, I did understand like, you know, um a character can be racist without the entire movie being that um and it, that's yeah. I, I, th I think that's part of what it, it's showing you know it was it was the 70s just like you know when at the very beginning when, when alana Haim is you know takes gary's picture like one of the one of the photographers like slaps her on the butt because it's the 70s and that's right. just what, what they did so i think that's part i think that's part of it but um i don't know it is kind of problematic to play for laughs yeah, and it, it it's the kind of laugh that like I it just felt weird. I was like, if I watched this in a in a big theater, I don't think it would have got a lot of laughs. I think it would have been really quiet and awkward. And that says everything it needs to say. Um, I, I, there are some fun set pieces with the uh, limits, of, or I should say, the boundless opportunities of 1970s Hollywood. Uh, we get some vandalism, some graffiti. We have kids starting up their own business. Pinball gets legalized in this film, and that's a whole thing. You know, there, there's some fun stuff in here. I, li I like the waterbed subplot. Uh, I don't. I, this is gonna. This is gonna out me. Uh, and is there actually a reason provided in the movie as to why it's called Licorice Pizza, or is that was that just like the name of the script? Uh, I read there, it was the name of a record chain for a while that was eventually bought by Sam Goody. Kind of, hey, kind okay. of what inspires it? There's not must have slipped right by me. Yeah. There's nothing, um, there's nothing uh super deep about it i don't think yeah like ultimately that this movie gives you some kind of fun set pieces but there's nothing super deep about it i it, it's kind of softball and and that's okay i think I, I don't think it was meant to be anything big it didn't have a giant release we didn't actually see it when it came out we're only watching it now on prime um I just, I don't know. I guess I, I, I've, I've recently hoped for more from the man, and I, I hope whatever he does next will be met much more on track with his previous works. I'm glad he's doing his own thing. But uh, written and directed by Paul Tom Sanderson, this movie does not uh, a good movie make. <sighs> I think that's it. Any other thoughts, Andy? I think I'm ready. Andy, would you recommend Licorice Pizza? Hard Pass. Ooh, Hard God. Pass. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, all right. I'm, Whoa. Gen I'm generally not 
on the uh the hard pass bow. I give very but this I just didn't really find anything really redeeming about this this film. Um you, you know, it's it's essentially the fantasy of a of a teenager. Like I said, he he's an incredible act, actor and successful businessman at 15 and has a 25 year old girlfriend. I mean, that sounds like a middle schooler wrote this um, there. They go on a series of adventures that don't really tie together to me. Didn't really have a lot of meaning. A lot of Haim's characters just constantly exploited and has like no agency or power of, of her own. Uh, yeah, it's too long. Uh yeah, I, I just didn't really. This is a biz. It's a swing and a miss from from PTA. Yeah, uh, I mostly agree. I'd say save it for streaming. I, I don't think this is a hard pass, in my opinion, because I, I really do like. I like it's the like. Pass. I really like the look of this movie. I know that sounds silly, but like, there's some really good cinematography in here with some really basic ideas, but it comes off looking great. Lots of good colors, fine acting, some fun set pieces. You know, in in its best moments, I think I think Licorice Pizza feels like a nostalgic look back at like the childhood of your right, like at seventy three Hollywood when anything was possible and kids were the kings of the world. Uh, in its worst moments, it feels like the drunken cigarette laced ramblings of a sixty five year old washed up Hollywood producer. So. I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't really know what you're getting into with licorice pizza, but I can tell you that it's going to be an experience. And in that way I'd save it for streaming. And with that, we should move into our next chunk of the episode. We'll do this often, but every few months, especially if we don't have a lot going on, we may talk about some upcoming features, some new things coming out down the line that you may have heard about or may not have heard about that we're excited to talk about on the show. Andy, what's this segment called? Fall movie preview. Yeah, that's the one. All right. Uh, so I'm going to jump in on it. Uh, our first week, starting in September, rolling all the way through October, opens with Barbarian on September 9th, a horror feature from directors from new director Zach Kreger. I don't know if he's actually made any features before now. Uh, that is supposed to be a pretty spooky little story of a young woman who checks into an Airbnb that uh, ultimately has more inside and under it than she than she bargained for. I don't know what exactly is going on in this movie. I've heard some very very early screening reviews who said watch it with a big crowd in a theater. It's a, it's a it's a fun horror flick. So I don't know. That's barbarian. Andy, any hot takes? uh yeah i'm I'm looking forward to that uh, uh like bill skarsgård uh justin long makes an appearance as well it looks spooky uh you know september is basically just pre-october anyways so um not too not too soon to get 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 your uh spooky movies started no not at all uh and also by the way the the reason we're skipping september 2nd is that's uh labor day and there's no new releases, but a, a number of re-releases. Uh, Spider-Man No Way Home, the fun stuff edition with an additional 11 minutes is going to be coming Ooh. out. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm sure that'll be fine. Top it Gun Maverick really is, uh, I think, going to have some like extra scenes or, or something. Oh, that God. Will... They're not even going to pull it out of theaters. It's just going to keep rolling. Yeah, They're yeah. Add the extended edition. Push. So that's kind of what's happening over the Labor Day weekend. Moving on to September 16th, we have uh, three pretty big releases. We have The Woman King, uh, starring Violet Davis, uh, which ha happens to deal with uh, African nations resisting uh, co uh, colonization in the 18th and 19th century. Uh, also stars John, John Boyega. Um, oh, I've lost that. Uh, Lashana Lynch, that's who I was thinking of. Oh. And, and like I said, um, Viola Davis. So that that looks uh, like a lot of fun. It's going to be some some more. It looks really brutal. Uh, Zach, what do you think about that? Uh, I'm actually kind of excited to see that one. Uh, it, it it does not seem like a premise that initially, uh, you know, your, your generic your generic movie boy would be super excited about. But like the choreography looks really sick. Viola Davis is a lot of fun. I like my boy John Boyega back. Uh, I don't know. My, my, might just be a banger. We'll see. <laughs> This is interesting. Written by, or one of the writing credits is uh, Maria Bello. Really? Yeah. Maria Bello. Green. Who is, uh, she She was a more prominent actress in the 2000s and uh, hasn't done as much lately. But I wonder if anyway. this is like maybe an early script she had worked on at some point and they just adapted it and they were like, well, you got to give her a writing credit. Well, I don't know. Maybe this is her hot new thing. Carrie Fisher wrote scripts. She's great at it. Um. 
the same weekend, September 16th, we, we see Pearl, which is the prequel film to X, the Ty West uh, pulp slasher that, that we saw about six months ago. And this is the prequel story. This, this looks like a lot of fun. It looks brutal. There's carnage. It's got that uh, kind of 70s feel, although it's going to take place in the 30s. That's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to that. Zach? Pearl's a weird story, but I think I'm excited to see it. When we saw the teaser after X, we were like, what the hell is this movie? And now that we're coming up on it, I think I'm excited about it. I think it might be. It's going to be fun. It's going to be mindless, fun popcorn cinema. That's what Pearl's going to be. And I like some, you know, I don't mind popcorn horror. Yeah. Uh, The other big release, this might be probably going to be a little bit limited uh, release, is See How They Run, which is the uh, whodunit comedy mystery starring Sam Rockwell, Adrian Brody, and Saoirse Ronan. Uh, that looks like like a lot of fun. Looks cheerful, uh, and I liked all those actors, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, also, looking forward to that. Looks, um, I don't know, what it reminds me of, but I'll have a good whodunit, and it's comedy whodunit, nostalgic, perfect. Can't wait to see the Oscar noms. Uh, for the week of September 23rd, we have one big feature to look forward to. That's Olivia Wilde's "Don't Worry, Darling." her follow-up to book smart from just a couple of years ago surprisingly well-received feature annie and i both loved it here on the show uh, don't worry darling is the story of florence Pugh and harry styles a young married couple who moved out to a compound it seems to be emulating like 1950s culture for work when uh, florence Pugh discovers that not all is as it seems in this strange dystopian paradise uh andy you excited about don't worry darling oh yeah it, it looks it looks really good i'm a little bit worried about the september release date uh but yeah love florence pew harry styles is in it uh chris pine it's it's some sort of weird sci-fi truman show-esque 13th floor if you remember that movie um mystery and <laughs> uh I'm, I'm definitely excited about that yeah me uh, too uh go ahead and then uh, coming the next week, September 30th, is Smile, which is another horror movie uh, that we've seen a lot of tra- trailers of. Doesn't star anyone one famous, but it uh, looks pretty creepy. I'm looking forward to that. And of course, the re-release of Avatar. Avatar, yeah. Oh, God. Oh, yes. 13 years later. Avatar is going to be returning to the to the big screen in anticipation of its sequel, Avatar: The Way of Water. So we might have to watch that for the show since it's the you know biggest movie of Cannot. all time. Basically, can I have we? I guess we've we've never reviewed Avatar on the show, have we? No. Why would we? I mean, slow week. It might might be Avatar week. <laughs> I smile will do fine. It looks like any other Bloomhouse horror. I don't actually think it's from Bloomhouse, but you know. The fine popcorn horror smile will be fine. Gimmick horror. Avatar, though, boy, oh boy, 4K, 3D, HDR, which if you don't know what any of that means, means it looks better than it's ever looked before. In a weird way, I think I might try to go catch it in IMAX. Let's see it real big. I mean, it's James Cameron, for God's sake. How could you not? If they were showing Titanic in IMAX, I might go see it, especially if it was in 4K, 3D, HDR. Mildly excited about Avatar. <laughs> we might end up watching it for the show. We'll see. Uh, next week, or I should say, uh, yeah, yeah, this is October 7th. There are two exciting films coming out. First is Amsterdam from director David Gordon Green, right? David O. Russell. I'm David sorry. O. Russell. Uh, similar <laughs> Davids, uh, one of which is embroiled in some minor scandal. It's this one. Anyway, uh, David o- uh, Amsterdam is a story set in the 30s following three friends who witness a murder, become suspects, and have to uncover an outrageous plot. Stars Christian Bale, John David Washington, and Margot Robbie as the three friends. What a cast. Good Lord. Is is a trio of, of, of crime hunting suspects. I mean, great. And then the, the cast list is just the poster and it's stunning. Chris Rock, Anya Taylor, Joy, Zoe Saldana, Mike Myers, Michael Shannon, Timothy Oliphant, Andrew Risebo, Taylor Swift. Good Lord. <laughs> you know, like it's like, yeah, our boy Alessandro Navolo is in there. Like it's going to be great. Navolo. Yeah. I, I'm excited. The other feature. Oh, sorry. Andy, any hot takes in Amsterdam? Yeah, uh, I'm uh, I'm really looking forward to that. That looks like a lot of fun. Looks looks funny. Love uh, Margot Robbie, John David Washington, uh, Christian Bale. Looks quirky. Looks really different. Really looking forward to that. The other feature coming out in October uh, is 
Hellraiser on Hulu. I've been reading about this, so I appreciate it. Right. Snuck it on here. Uh, the Hellraiser remake, remake, right? Full remake, reboot uh, is coming to Hulu, starring a young woman who finds this mysterious box and opens it, not knowing that she is unleashing the Cenobites of Hell upon the Earth. Uh, Hellraiser's rad, and I hope this movie's good. I hope it does not follow in the footsteps of Netflix's Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I hope this is something exciting. Uh, Andy, excited about Hellraiser? Oh yes, yeah. so Hellraiser is one of my favorite uh, properties from from the eighties. Uh, this one, like I said, it's, it's coming out on, on Hulu, so it is streaming only. Uh, but it it is starring Pinhead is being played by Jamie Clayton uh, from Sense Eight, so uh, we are getting uh, kind of an androgynous slash Lady Pinhead, which is going to be exciting. There's a teaser out right now, just fifteen seconds long. I caught earlier today, so it means we'll probably get in, be getting the trailer soon. Is it just hold on? Is it just like a logo? Or is there anything cool happening there? You, it's it's the it's the title scrolls across the screen, but you can see Pinhead in the background. Oh, okay, yeah, I dig that. Yeah, hopefully trailer soon. That'd be good. On on the fourteenth, uh, which is actually my birthday, so I'll see what I'm hey! seeing. <laughs> seeing that weekend. We have Halloween ends. The <laughs> conclusion to this version of the uh mike myers evil dies tonight uh trilogy so that'll be a big release that weekend uh, another one that i am looking forward to is a decision to leave which is a korean film by director park chan wook who famously did old boy and uh another a number of other classic uh, Korean cinemas. I don't really know. The t- the tagline here is uh, a detective investigating the man's death in the mountain meets the dead man's mysterious wife in the course of his sleuthing. So there, it looks like a murder mystery. And if you know anything about Park Chan Wook, it's there's going to be way more. There's going to be violence, brutality, mystery, sensuality, all those things. Uh, I, I heard that this was being submitted as Korea's uh, entry into best international feature that's where i've heard of this one yeah i was like why do i know this movie that's it's it's south korea's yeah submission got it um and then finally also will be in a little bit heavier vein is till which is uh the story of emmett till and uh his tragic murder in in the 50s and follows the, the devastation of the community and his mother and things like that uh i'm excited <laughs> Sorry, I just Listen, went through all through all through. This. It's Sorry. fine. Listen, when you say that Halloween ends is the conclusion of this Michael Myers story, no, no, it's the Michael Myers story, my friend. This, this is the real one. This is Jamie Lee Curtis finally going out, just like she did in Halloween four and five and seven. <laughs> it's gonna, She's this dead is gonna for be real, real this one. time. It, yeah, this one they this time they mean it. He, this time he means business. Uh, Halloween ends is coming day and date to uh, Peacock as well, which is weird. Yes. They just announced that. Yeah. So if you don't want to watch that in theaters, you can watch it in the comfort of your own home for only uh, however much Peacock costs a month. I don't know much about Decision to Leave, but I'm excited to walk, watch it. Uh, Till looks real heavy, man. <laughs> Till looks real heavy. Uh, I do think I want to see that. I might wait for reviews and see if it's worth like waiting for it to come home and watch it. Like, God, just looks like a looks like a heart wrencher at the movies uh but an important story i think uh last week of october two big features to look forward to number one black adam my god the rock is finally entering the superhero space in dc's very own black adam uh bow of shazam friend to none black adam is like superman but he can kill andy excited about black adam uh sort of we'll see it looks that first trailer was really generic uh we're probably due for another trailer soon uh we'll see i'm more excited about the uh like the backup team the justice society of america's in there uh which involves dr fate cyclone uh hawkman and someone else i think uh adam adam smasher something like that uh has yet to be seen i mean the rocky is i mean he's always fun to watch on screen i'm sure it'll be fine uh, the question is about like you know will it be good or could it be great yeah we'll have to see uh, black adam might be heat i mean i don't know when it comes out it comes out uh our last uh film in october is the banshees of inishiran which is the mark mcdonough story uh of two grown men who in ireland who get an argument one day and cannot seem to settle their differences uh it stars 
Colin Farrell and uh, Brendan Gleeson as mm-hmm. two mutuals. And uh, I don't know. Looks a whole lot like Bolt Cinema. It's, it's old men talking in dimly lit rooms. That's that's the kind of movie I can get behind. Andy, what do you think of this one? I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, of course, Martin McDonald also did three b- billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri, Seven Psychopaths, and uh, in Bruges. And th- in, this reunites Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson from that. I, I think it looks funny. It looks charming. Uh, it's probably going to have some seriousness uh, to it as well. Definitely looking forward to it. Well, speaking of funny and charming and some seriousness, I think that's a perfect intro for our last feature this episode. Andy's taking the summer on this one. Uh, Andy, please take it away. Belfast. So Belfast is the 2021 film from director Kenneth Branagh, who, uh, of course, did Death on the Nile, Murder on the Ordinance, Orient Express he directed a number of movies and and is well or, known as an Thor the Dark World. <laughs> yeah. And, and is a well known actor. This is a semi autobiographical film based on uh his life growing up in uh Belfast during uh, the time of what's known as the the trouble. The movie takes place in 1969 uh in Belfast, Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland um we meet Buddy, who is 10 years old. He He's a young, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed kid who lives in this neighborhood where everyone knows each other, everyone's close friends. And the very first thing that happens is a massive kind of riot breaks out where uh, this big Protestant gang comes through the neighborhood and uh, basically torches every, every home of anyone who, who's Catholic. And so this, this story starts with a great deal of violence. Buddy and his family are Protestant, so they are in a sense, kind of safe. They're safer from the violence. They are not the target, but they are still amongst it. And it's, you know, it's a very dangerous situation. And uh, for those not familiar with with the troubles, it was a very chaotic conflict, nearly 25 years, 3000 people died over, over the course from, you know, 1969 through about 1994 there were militia groups on both sides uh protestant and catholic this is where the uh the infamous ira uh developed on on the catholic side eventually the british government sent troops in to quell the violence but they were more or less on the protestant side so they they weren't exactly welcome they didn't really help things for life is a long and bloody uh conflict and the story takes place kind of at the very beginning of it and uh buddy is just trying to get through through life he's he's 10 years old he goes to school he plays with his friends there's a girl he likes um he lives in you know he's very close with his family uh his his mother his mother played by catriona balfe who's who's really great in this movie jamie dornan is his father judy gench is grandmother and the Saran Hines as uh, the grandfather. So they have this really tight knit family and it's just a big conflict of whether to go or to stay there. They love where they live. They've lived here for generations. This is their home. This is their people. They don't want to leave, but the violence and threats of violence just get closer and closer to home. So this was nominated for several Academy Awards, one for best original screenplay for uh, Kenneth, Branagh and uh, yeah that, that's Belfast Zach what do you think so I think Belfast is a really unique feature uh, that comes from a really heartfelt place uh, Kenneth Branagh is pretty obviously uh, buddy this is autobiographical uh, this is most of stuff that he remembers from his life from growing up in Belfast and having to move away uh, I I think this movie is really well made I like I think the, the spirit of it but it didn't quite charm me in the way that I think I had hoped it would. I, I thought of films like Taika Waititi's Jojo Rabbit, like a much more nostalgic look back at a childhood uh, smeared with like the violence of adults in situations uh, kids ultimately can't control. Uh, but those are two very different features. And I think I maybe went in with kind of the wrong expectation here. I liked Belfast. In fact, I liked how much better I liked this movie than Kenneth Branagh's other features. <laughs> and what's interesting is, is this one is, is kind of the most loosely put together of all of them. But let's let's talk about what works and what doesn't. Ultimately, I, I will leave my recommendation at the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, first off, really great performances. Uh, there were a number of Academy Award nominations, Judy Dench and Saron Hines were both nominated for supporting uh, actors. I, although I, I think uh, the mother, uh, Catriona Balfe, is um, 
probably the, yeah, the best. Be she's just not a name, unfortunately. That's why she didn't get the nomination. Uh, but I, uh, the story of, of him of of Buddy just growing up in this and having his, you know, having to kind of perceive this really violent world, but in in kind of in the eyes of a child, and and for things to be explained to him in a childlike way is really it's really it's really powerful and it's just you know it, it's about family it's about home and the struggles that they're all having the their the father the grandfather is ill he's you know it's revealed he was a coal miner for many years and we know that it's, it's a terrible occupation to have so he has lots of of health problems uh the the father played by jamie dornan has a the family is struggling financially and, and Jamie Dornan has a, a bit of a horse racing problem. And he also works away. He works in England and he's gone for weeks at a time, uh, leaving uh, the mother to ha have to raise the kids and by, by herself. So it's, it's a real struggle that, that they're in. Yeah. And, and I think Brana like obviously is pulling that from his childhood and kind of, seeing that through the lens of you know somebody who's, who's not who's not taller than waist high a little, little, little 10 year old and i think that's sincere uh what's interesting about this movie to me is the way it was shot uh i didn't know uh andy filled me in on this that this film was shot entirely digital uh this is only brana's second feature to be shot entirely digital uh typically he shoots on film 35 millimeter or 65 millimeter but they shot on digital basically for budget and space reasons uh because they were shooting this during the pandemic i think uh additionally this film is shot using almost entirely natural light uh which is part of the reason it's in black and white um, they did not use a lot of stand-up lights mostly it's sunlight is is how they shot this feature and it comes off looking like very intimate and very sincere and like that's so different <laughs> from how i felt about uh the other feature that brana shot in 2021 which was death on the nile maybe shot in 2020 i'm not sure but i think it was 2021 um this movie feels so different than that movie not just because of its tone and because this one's in black and white but because this one comes from a, such a more sincere place I think Braun has had his whole life to think about making this movie. Mm -hmm. And he, he he really swung for the fences. Really great camera work. It's not it's not just how it looks, it's where the camera is placed. Like really creative placements, really thoughtful shot composition. I like Belfast. I like the look of Belfast a lot. The only thing I didn't like, I think, is I found myself a little bored with the plot. I I I don't know a lot about uh the conflicts in Ireland through the 1960s. Maybe I should find out more but this movie doesn't do a, doesn't do a great job of like educating you it kind of just drops you into the setting a little like jojo rabbit in world war ii yeah it's you a can't watch the, jojo rabbit background yeah yeah you can't watch jojo rabbit and have an understanding of what what's going on in world war ii it's just a very specific instance from a kid who doesn't really know any better right um and i think that was something i wasn't really i don't know wasn't, wasn't really ready for mentally so yeah that's that that's my initial hot take but i like the performances yeah I, I think you're right ma in the film played by miss belf is fantastic as far as i know the only really real thing she's done she's in ford v ferrari and she's an outlander i think she's the main character in outlander or one of the main characters in outlander at the tv show um but i liked everybody in it i i guess i found myself uniquely frustrated with um kind of our our, our pacing our characters deciding whether or not they should stay in belfast or maybe you know get out of there and go go to a place that's safer to raise a family um i found myself uniquely divided by that opinion <laughs> and maybe not on the maybe not on the right side of where the viewers are supposed to be but the film does do a really good job of, of, of bringing that around in an emotional manner uh for the people who left the country and the people who didn't and I, I think in a really really satisfying way i think braun's got a lot to say about it yeah one of the things i like about the like i really like the black and white um, I wish it wasn't on digital because it's actually it's a little bit too crisp. Like it doesn't it's very look, crisp. Yeah. It, it, it looks like this is taking place today and it needs to look like it took place 60 years ago. Um, but that I, I don't think he had he he couldn't use actually um, for whatever reason he couldn't use uh, traditional film. Uh, so that's one thing that, that kind of takes me out of it a little bit is the film looks a little bit too good. Uh, also, you can tell. So I read that they they recreated kind of the block that that where the 
the street that takes place. So they didn't actually shoot on on location, and you can tell a little bit. It looks a little bit like a Hollywood stage or a Hollywood recreation. Um. So, but those are just uh r- really nitpicks. It it would help if they explained the conflict and kind of the source of the conflict, and also just how severe it was. It was. I mean, it was. It was really dirty because it was basically guerrilla warfare on both sides, and there were, you know, this th- there would be riot, there would be protests, they would turn violent. There, the paramilitary groups would come out and clash, and you would have, you know, one side, one side bombs the other, the other side bombs back, the other side kidnaps someone, the other side kills someone on the other side. Like it, it was really a uh, very long horrific conflict and it doesn't really get into how that all came about and why it was happening in the first place and i think for for those uninitiated would it would be helpful i did like the way the film brushes violence under the rug um i mean it's obviously a problem characters are dealing with but like a lot of the people in a lot of the characters in the film just call it like the trouble they're like oh yeah there's some some crazy stuff happening around here lately and it's like people are dying (laughs) like horrific murder in the streets and is becoming a police state and they're just like what some crazy things going on and i think that's important because it sets the scene for like a kid who doesn't really understand Mm -hmm. what's going on exactly and it's like well why why are things this way and and why are mom and dad fighting and why are people out in the street you know throwing molotov cocktails at each other like and it creates a unique setting for uh the buddy's parents to have it out and to say hey we should stay we should go we should do this we should do that i think that stuff's important um it's difficult though for me as a viewer not knowing a lot about it to share sentiments with characters who think it is wise to stay in these settings there are characters who are like we shouldn't we shouldn't move away that's silly and it's like okay is it violent or isn't it like, because I can't really, I, the movie doesn't really give me that direction. I think if I had a, had a history lesson, I, because I, I was under the perception that, like, yeah, a- every family should be fleeing that country as fast <laughs> as humanly possible. But that is so not the case for the characters in Belfast. A lot of them mm-hmm. feel like, no, it'll blow over. It'll be fine. It, it'll work itself out, you know. And ultimately, mm-hmm. I think just like Buddy, it's a movie about not having control like be, being unable to control your surroundings even if you feel like it's a place you've been for a long time yeah the uh there is a great speech by uh by ma uh about halfway through the, the film where th- they eventually get this opportunity to possibly move to london closer to where uh the father works and they can take the whole family they'll be be a house and uh she's incredibly terrified to leave because she said we don't we don't speak like they do over there we won't be understood we'll be second class citizens they know that our people kill their soldiers like we won't get work we won't have friends like it, it's you know everyone here knows us everyone here knows our kids like it, it's a real like it's the struggle of of tearing your roots out and going somewhere else especially somewhere else where you might not be welcome and that's almost as scary as, as staying amid the violence yeah and i think ultimately like that's part of what works so well about belfast like the, this kind of central conflict is surprisingly divisive i i landed on the opposite side of that that very same scene i was like okay your husband you're basically raising your kids on your own your husband is barely around because he has to work and he can only get work in freaking England because your country's economy is not doing great and it's only getting worse. Everything's going to hell. Like, and you're like, why would we leave? What are you crazy? Like, it, it's just, yeah, like you, you find yourself uniquely landing on one side of these two characters. And I think the movie does a good job of finding its way through it and, and ultimately kind of tugging Buddy along for the ride. Uh, but it does uh, I don't know. I, I, I just didn't I didn't find myself quite as taken with it. I, I think I was hurt by not watching it in a theater. Watching it at home was not the same. <laughs> I think yeah, if I'd def- seen this on the big screen, I think yeah, I think it well. like really would have come together better. And I can appreciate its runtime. It's barely at ninety eight minutes. Boy oh boy. God, I wish every movie was ninety eight minutes. <laughs> uh ultimately like it's a surprisingly tight package with, with a really Really, really sincere, soft, chewy set. And uh, I wonder where, where that, where, where's that writer director, Kenneth Branagh on every other production he works on. Um, this one felt like it came from somewhere different. 
yeah, it, this film does feel very personal, very intimate, and it, it it's just so much more creative with with the music, with the the camera and and lighting, and um, just tells such a more rich story than you know again something like uh, Death on the, the Nile. So it, exactly, I would love to see Kenneth Branagh get to do passion projects like this more often. Yeah. Um, ultimately, Belfast does seem to be unique in its own space. I, I think it's something different. I'm excited we had a chance to watch it. I think I get why it was nominated for so many Academy Awards. It seemed weird at the time because we had just seen Death of the Nile and we both did not love that movie. But watching this now, I think I get it. Um, oh, one more thing. Way, way, way too much Van Morrison. This movie features no <laughs> less than 10 tracks from van morrison my it's a 98 minute feature which means less than every 10 minutes you're getting a new van morrison track my god i was so over it by <laughs> like i know van morrison is from from ireland he's probably from belfast but my god i was i was like oh god it just runs together uh anyway hot hot critique too much van morrison you wouldn't think you can go to yeah too much but you can any other uh any thoughts or recommendations andy uh, no, I think I'm ready. Uh, Andy, would you recommend Belfast? Yeah, I would. I, I really enjoyed this. This I thought it was really touching. The, the family struggle is is very real. The uh, this concept of, of home and where home is, and you know the family you have inside and outside your home. Uh, it was really charming. The 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 young buddy who was played by newcomer Jude Hill. Uh, is really sweet and, and endearing again and it's not not too long and it this is a, a film like i may not watch this again but i'll definitely i can see myself referring back to this because of of the quality filmmaking that, that we see it's uh one of the things i also want to mention it's about growing up in the 60s so you see things like star trek on tv chitty chitty bang bang on the screen that it's it's about that that time in in life uh, but i really liked it Rit, and uh, highly recommend yeah i i I liked it as well. I think I, I did not quite love it in the way that Andy did. I wish I'd seen it in a theater. If there was a retro screening, maybe I'd say that's the best way to catch this one. Honestly, I don't think do it, doing it in, I don't think doing it at home quite comes around the same way, but it's obviously available on HBO max. If you're interested, turn off the lights, grab yourself a you know glass of wine or your favorite beverage. Check out Belfast. Like it's, it's not bad. And it's a fast ride too, which is pleasant. Like you're not, you're not going to be mired in two hours and 18 minutes of, uh, the ever elusive licorice pizza. <laughs> so that's our show. That's our show for the week. God, episode one. What is this? Episode 187 under our belts. Uh, we're coming up on that big 200. We're gonna have to blow it out big before we get there. We need to talk about what we're watching next week. Andy, what are we watching? We are watching 3,000 Years of Longing, which is the latest George Miller film, who famously did uh, the Mad Max, Mad Max Fury Road. Most recently, this is his. his I guess his first film uh, since then. Uh, and this is a story about a genie uh, played by Idris Elba. And uh, Tilda Swinton is the person who releases said genie. And I I don't really know what it's about. It, it looks cra- It looks really crazy. It has really fun visuals. But I love the director and Tilda Swinton and Idris Elba are always solid. So I'm looking forward to that. And then Samaritan, which we haven't talked about before. But this is a new film that will be streaming on Amazon Prime. Uh, and this stars Sylvester Stallone uh, as essentially kind of a retired superhero. This is a superhero film. Uh, a young boy learns that Sylvester Stallone's character is as a superhero who everyone thought disappeared 20 years before um, and what that means now and as being an old man in, in retirement. Uh, looks, all, looks all right. And it's on <laughs> that'll be streaming. A little Unbreakable, a little Logan. Yeah, Samaritan might actually be good. Who knows? And, and hey, who doesn't love Sly Stallone? Uh, Andy, you seen any of these early reviews for 3,000 Years of Longing? I have not. No. All right, well, we're, we're going to talk about it next week, so don't <laughs> worry about it. Uh, if you enjoyed the show today, if you like what we're doing here, if you have any hot takes on Licorice Pizza, Belfast, anything exciting coming out, or maybe some of those news stories we talked about at the beginning, uh, you can follow us on Facebook where we live stream the show every Tuesday, including right now. As we're recording this right now, it's going to Facebook, and you can follow us over there to keep up with us. We're on YouTube where we upload our live streams. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're on all the usual podcast outlets, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartMedia. We got a website, offscriptfilmview.com, and you can mail us correspondence and your hot takes if you don't want to hit us in the comments at mail at offscriptfilmreview.com but the biggest thing you can do to help out your boys here at offscript is just subscribe 
to subscribe to get new episodes of off script delivered straight to your phone every single week subscribe on youtube itunes whatever platform you're on drop that hot subscription and while you're at it hit a notification bell and uh hit us with some ratings and reviews if you could swing it that's some good good podcast listener etiquette we'd really appreciate it you have no idea how much it helps us you're probably thinking what's one review right in a sea of reviews it helps i promise it helps and we're excited to read it because we want to hear from you the fans who have been here for 187 episodes and counting and will likely be here for episode 188 next week uh, i think that about wraps everything thanks for listening from all of us at off script the home of bold cinema i'm zach lewis and i'm dr draper thanks for watching